Good morning. I know that fall officially started last week, but at the first of the week, did it feel like fall? No. And it still doesn't yet. And Randy said, it's supposed to be a cool front coming through. I said, 84 degrees is not a cool front. He said, it is to 95. <laughs> so anyway, we're so glad you came this morning. Um, we did have some wonderful rain and our grass will grow again. I know that won't be too happy for people that mow, but still it doesn't smell charred and everything. God is good, isn't he? He is so good. So join us this morning as we sing about fall. And I do want to brag about uh, Brother Toby's uh, sign. His signs outside that he's been putting have been going with this theme. And be sure and read it this morning. It's really good. And also on the bulletin, when he's putting the thing on the bulletin, it goes with that too. And I, I appreciate that. Well, good morning. I can thank you for being here this morning. So good to see all of you here this morning. and so thankful to have visitors here as well. So happy to see you here this morning. Uh, just to let you know a couple things coming on. Um, right after church this morning, we're going to have a trunk retreat meeting. So any of you uh, interested in, in participating in our trunk retreat, please uh, stay right after church this morning. That way we can kind of talk about what to expect. That way we can kind of let you go for the whole month about your decorations and getting ready for that. As well, so right after church this morning, we'll have a trunk or treat meeting. There's also a sign-up sheet back here by the whiteboard on the right-hand side, uh, your left. So if you're interested in helping with, with trunk or treat or having a trunk, then go ahead and sign up, and you'll put your name, your theme. So if you're doing something, you know, Disney theme, you know, Nemo theme, not Nemo or pirate, pirate, you know, just whatever theme, so you can kind of see how many fishers we'll have or, you know, something of that nature. And there's also um, a question, do you need electricity? because we have, have to be very strategic with our placement of plug-ins. And so if you need electricity, we don't need you all the way out toward the field. We need to get you closer to the plug-in. So if you would, please fill that out. Uh, there's also going to be a love offering taking this morning, this evening, and the next morning and next evening, or next Sunday uh, during the, meeting, or the morning and evening uh, for the Wilkinson's family. So please remember that. And if you're not prepared this week, we'll, we'll do it once more next week uh, to help them. There's also going to be a bridal shower the 16th at 10 a.m. for... Uh, Josh and Caitlin, so please remember that. There's also been a ring found. Um, Brother Larry found a ring out somewhere outside. So if you lost a ring, probably Wednesday, more than likely. Um, so if you lost a ring, if you can describe it to me, you can get it back. Uh, it's not just 
a little plastic one. It actually looks like a real ring. So if you can describe it to me, uh, or possibly you lost it, then we'll get that reconnected with you. Um, and then uh, Brother Toby's also planning a family farm trip, and there's a sign-up sheet back here right beside the Trunk or Treat sign-up. So a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we're pretty much in full swing. And also on Wednesday nights, if you're not aware, uh, we're doing a new program on Wednesday nights, and we've had a very good turnout. Uh, we're having about 33 kids, and then the adult class is, is meeting as well. Um, with so many that we've already had to order more books and more supplies, and that's coming in. And so uh, it's, it's being very, very beneficial. And so I would like to encourage you, if you're not uh, participating in our Wednesday night activities, and I would like to encourage you to do so. Uh, we are still teaching the Bible, teaching the memorization of the Bible. Um, we're still playing it on God's Word. So if you would like to please uh, make plans to attend that, we'd love to have you. And so with that, let's go ahead and open in prayer, if you would. Father, we're so thankful for the day that you provided. And Lord, we're thankful for the, for the ability to come to your house this morning. Father, we ask that as we assemble, that everything we do here is for your honor and for your glory. Father, allow us to sing the songs that Sister Christie has prepared uh, with joy and with gladness as we honor and seek to praise you in your name. Father, we're so thankful for the gift of Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, for your love for us and how you came to this world to die on a cross on our behalf. Father, we know we could never have earned it. We know we don't deserve it. And for that, Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Father, we ask that as we try to seek after you and follow after you, Lord, we pray that we can do so as best we can. Father, we pray for this church, and we ask you to lead us, and we pray, Lord, that we will obediently follow you in every step of your will. And Father, we also pray for the sister churches in our area, Lord, as they also try to follow you and to build your kingdom. And Father, we pray that you bless all of our efforts. Lord, we pray that you'll reach the lost, that the message this morning will convict. And Father, we pray that we may be effective evangelists, effective sowers, and effective reapers, so we can build your kingdom and advance your message. Father, we love you and we praise you. Forgive us of our sin and forgive us where we fail you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Sister Christy.
if you would this morning, go ahead and be turning with me to the book of Acts. And if you're new here with us, this year we've been going through the book of Acts, looking at the church, looking at the uh, church that Jesus began, and the apostles really took it and ran with it and did their job uh, effectively. And we've been going through the book of Acts, and we come to chapter 22. And like I said, we've been going through Acts this year. It started in January, and now we're to spooky season, or October, and we come to Acts chapter 22. This season is probably my favorite time of year. I love the fall, not just because my birthday is in the fall, but because the weather starts changing, football's on, um, you can sit outside beside a fire. Uh, it's just a nice time of year. The colors of the, the leaves start changing. I just think it's a pretty time of year. Y'all can burn in the summer all you want to. I like putting on clothing. You can always put more clothing on. There becomes a line where you can't take any more off or else it becomes illegal. So I like the fall. But there's a tradition that happens around a campfire is when you tell a story. And you can't just tell a story. You have to get the flashlight and shine it up menacingly and you begin to tell your story. And there's something about stories that we just like. There's a reason we have novels. There's a reason we have books. It's, it's just, we like them. We get drawn into them. And we really focus, and sometimes we place ourselves within the story. Have you ever done that? Been reading a thrilling book, and you place yourself there, and you're actually in the book. Maybe y'all aren't imagine, uh, much of an imagination as you read as I do, but you place yourself there. There's just something about a story. And in Acts chapter 22, we come to... The section, like we said last week, it's a difficult section to, to cover because it's just so much happening in so many chapters, but it's just one event. We'll come to Acts chapter 22, and actually back up, we'll establish the context. If you back up to Acts 21, looking at verse 37. He says, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, and then we go into chapter 22. But if you remember from last week, Paul, um, there were some rumors going around town that Paul was speaking against Judaism, against the law, against the custom. And so they wanted to kill him. They didn't like him. They didn't want him to be around. And so they come, and of course, a riot really breaks out. Confusion is running rampant. And so Rome steps in, and the army comes, and the commanders take Paul, and they're trying to figure out who he is, but the crowd won't let him talk about it. He can't figure out, he can't get one unified answer about who Paul is or what Paul has done. And so he begins to take them back into the barracks. And if you remember from last week, the barracks were connected to the temple. And so they were beginning to go up the stairs, and he asked the commander, he says, can I talk to you? And of course, they, he didn't think that this was anyone important, but Paul wasn't ignorant. Sometimes we think that he was an unintelligent, uh, unintelligent man, but he was, he was intelligent. He's about to speak Hebrew here in a moment. He's speaking Greek to the commander. He's an intelligent guy. And he says, let me talk to the crowd. And at this point in time, the commander just wants the crowd to leave. He doesn't want his higher-ups to know that what's going on. He doesn't want the, the uh, Rome to know that there's been a problem. He just wants to take care of it, get rid of it. He's not too worried about saving Paul. He just wants to save himself. And so he's like, sure, if it'll, if it'll calm the crowd down, go ahead and talk to him. So chapter 22 begins his speech to the angry mob. He says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bear me witness, and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains 
even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. And so he starts off and he basically establishes himself as a Jew. He wasn't a half-breed. He wasn't a Hellenistic Jew. He was a purebred. He was fully Jewish. He was born in Tarsus. He spoke to them in, in Hebrew. He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. So he was taught the law from a, a respected rabbi. He was raised up in this tradition, in this customary society. And he tells them in verse 3, he says, I was zealous toward God as all of you are today. It's interesting, he, he does two things to begin the conversation. The first one in verse 1, he refers to them as family. He says, brethren and fathers. He establishes this idea that we're the same. He connects to them and basically says, out of respect, brethren and, and fathers. He says, we're both of the nation of Israel. Respectfully, I'm coming to you and I'm speaking to you. But then in verse 3, he tells them that he was taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. He starts off with compliments. In a day where we run to Facebook to chew each other out and to cause so many problems, he compliments them. They want him dead. Remember back in, in chapter 21, about halfway through, they said, away with him, kill him. They were going to beat him to death. They were not his friends. And yet he comes to them and he says, look, I respect you. I was the same as you. I was zealous toward the law of God just as you are today. He says, I understand where you're coming from. And he continues, he says, I, uh, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And here's what he says I, I'm going to do with them in, in the end of verse 5. He says, I'm going to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem, or there to Jerusalem, to be punished. You see the irony that's in the Bible? Paul began his journey as a persecutor of the church, headed to Damascus to bind Christians, bring them back bound, handcuffed, in chains, in bondage, back to Jerusalem to be punished. God saved him on the way to Damascus. He took him into the city. He meets Ananias. We'll talk about him in just a moment. And then for the span of the rest of Paul's life until this point, he has been a missionary preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching salvation, talking about how there's no other way to be saved except by the blood of Jesus. And now here he is in Jerusalem, bound, about to be punished for the same thing he went to do in Damascus. See the irony there? It's come full circle. He began as a persecutor to bring them back and punish them, and now here he comes, bound to Jerusalem, and he's about to be punished for being a part of the way. It's come full circle. And he says, here, basically in verse 5, he says, if you don't believe me, let's talk to the chief priest. Because I didn't just do this on my own accord. I actually went and received an author, uh, authorization to go to Damascus and to bring them. So if there's any question about if I'm telling the truth or not, let's talk to the council. Let's talk to the chief priest. He's establishing that he is, in fact, telling the truth. So in verse 6, he says, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. Now, if you remember, we went over this years, it seems, ago in chapter 9. Paul's going to Damascus. He meets Jesus on the road. And if we go and we recount that section of the Bible, there are some differences. And people say, well, that's a contradiction in the Bible. We can't believe the Bible. But that's not accurate. We look in chapter 9, that was Luke writing what was going on. This is Paul actually telling the people what was happening. There should be some differences in the accounts. You can go and you can say, did you hear about what happened? Sure, I heard about it. But if I was actually there and I actually know what happened, the story might be a little different. And so there should be some differences in this story. And the first one that we see is that it was about noontime. Luke doesn't throw in that detail. He says, Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the idea is that basically Saul was going to Damascus. Yes, he was going to persecute Christians. But when you persecute the Lord's people, it's not just the people you're persecuting. It's the Savior behind whom those people stand for. And so he's going to Damascus, yes, to bind Christians, but more importantly, to stand against the Lord's church. 
It becomes a dangerous thing when you start to persecute and you start to cause problems in the Lord's church. Not because this is our church, it's a church of the people, but it's the church of the living Lord God Almighty. It's a scary thing to stand against the Lord's church. And so Jesus responds to him and he asks, Why are you persecuting me? It is a personal offense. So verse 8, Paul answers and he says, Who are you, Lord? Basically, who are you, master, teacher, rabbi? And he said to him, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light, and they were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. And so another uh, incident we don't have in chapter 9, verse 10. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. And then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. So basically, he throws in another key character when he's trying to establish a relationship with his people. Now he brings in this respectable man named Ananias. And he tells them, basically, Ananias is a devout man according to the law. But he also has a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. Paul is trying to establish credibility in his story. And so he's brought up the chief priest and the council. He's brought up the fact that he's born a Jew. And now he brings Ananias into the mix. And Ananias probably saying, leave me out of it. I don't want any part of it. But he said he was a devout man, and he is telling, he's telling the truth. And so he came to me. He said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. The same hour I looked up at him. And he said to me, The God of our fathers, in verse 14, has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now this idea of baptism doesn't wash your sins away, but in Judaism it does carry the same sort of sense as salvation. The idea that water washes away sins, it is, it is there uh, in Judaism. And so he basically says, arise, be baptized, you've been saved, be baptized. So in verse 17, now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. It's a very interesting detail that we sometimes read over and skip over. But the idea is, back in verse, or chapter 21, they talked about him basically doing away with the law. The law wasn't important. The law of Moses wasn't important. Well, that would carry the idea that the temple was not important. And yet here is Paul coming back in verse uh, 17, and he says, I returned to Jerusalem, and I was praying in the temple. Meaning I was there in the temple and I was in a trance. That was kind of their idea that the temple was where God dwelt, where he was. And so if you were to experience God, you had to be in the temple. And so he's verifying once again what happened. Verse 18, he saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know uh, that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now Paul recounts his story. He's interrupted in verse 22. But he tells his story. And basically what he does is he gives them a rundown of his testimony. He says, I was born a Jew. He didn't really leave out any detail. He said, I was born a Jew. I was raised at the feet of a, of a religious law teacher. He says, I was zealous for my religion. But then I had an encounter with Jesus. And that encounter really changed my life. And he told me to go away from Jerusalem, but he told me to do something in verse 21. He says, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now, if we see in verse 22, they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, 
for he is not fit to live. That was the problem they had with him. They were so divided between Jews and, and the Gentiles. They had such a hatred for the, for the Gentiles that there is no way the Jewish God could love people so disgusting. And so for this man to be told from God to go to the Gentiles, he must be lying. He must be blaspheming. And so they basically they pronounce this punishment on him. He says, away with such a fellow. He's not fit to live. They speak to him, destruction and death. But this morning, I want to offer you a little bit of hope in verse 21. Paul tells them, he says, I will send you, speaking from God, God spoke to him, he says, I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. That gives me hope because you know what I am? I'm a Gentile. I'm someone who's not a Jew. I am the other kind, and so I'm a Gentile. And so that means that God loved me enough to not only save this persecutor of the church, save him, but send him out to my kind. Obviously, Paul didn't come to me, but he came to my kind. And with that, he took the gospel to the Gentiles. And in the same manner, we too should be taking the gospel to the Gentiles. These Gentiles were not normal, everyday, religious, lawful people in regard to Judaism. They were the outcast. They were the dirty people. They were the ones looked down on from the Jews. They were looked down on from the religious. And God loved them so much, he sent Paul to them and wanted them to understand the importance that he placed on them. And sometimes we can, get, we can become guilty of acting in the same manner as the Jews do. We don't want to talk to somebody because what will people think if they see us talking together? I don't want to talk to so-and-so because they're, they live a different lifestyle than I do. But the fact of the matter is the love of God does not escape them. The Lord loves them just as much as he loves me, maybe even more. And so I have a responsibility, and so do we, to be an evangelist. And when we talk about evangelism, Bruce has been going through a study on Wednesday nights about evangelism. We talk about evangelism as this one big ordeal and this big process. And you have to be you know, certified. You have to have the right credentials. No one can just be an evangelist. But you know you can. It's not difficult. You don't have to have a seminary education, a college degree, a high school education. You know what you have to have? A testimony. We talked about a story earlier. Why are stories so captivating? For me, I don't know about you, but for me, I can see that story. I can place myself in that story. I can identify with it. How many of you shop on online? Shop on online. How many of you shop online? Maybe some of you are like, my wife doesn't know. I'm not going to raise my hand. A lot of you shop online. I shop online. You know what I read the heading, the price, how fast I can get it, and the reviews. After I see it's got good reviews, you know what I'll go to, to look at? The description. Will it fit where I want it? Will it do what I want it to do? But I'll start pretty much with the reviews. Because I want to know the real life behind the situation. And you know, people, the same, uh, people today are the same way. They can read the Bible. But if they hear a review, for lack of a better word, if they hear a story or a testimony, it's more likely to have some sort of impact on them. Paul talks about Ananias. He said he had a good testimony. You don't have to have a testimony like Paul. And we look at Paul as we say, well, he had such an amazing testimony. He was going to persecute and to kill people, that murderer he was. And a light shone from heaven, this glorious light shone down from the Lord, and he was saved and baptized, and he became a minister and wrote the, the bulk of the New Testament. 99.9% .9 of salvations aren't like that. Mine wasn't like that. I'm sure some of, your, some of yours weren't either. If they were, I want to know. I want to hear about that if they were. But that's the thing. Each and every one of us in this room has a testimony. We have a story. Now, if you give me your birthday, you also need to give me your social security number. But you don't have to go that in depth. You know what you have to do? Tell people what the Lord did 
for you. I was a sinner, separated from God, completely unabridged gap in between me and the Lord. Not because the Lord was mean or the Lord didn't do his job, but because I am unrighteous. Because I am dirty. Because I am a sinner. But my story doesn't end there. God looked down, he saw me, and he loved me. And he sent his son, the son he loved, the son he cherished. He called him the only begotten, the, the more than beloved son. To die on a tree, not because he wanted to, but because he wanted me. Because he wanted me to have a relationship with him. And if that was the only blessing I ever received from the Lord, that'd be enough. And yet, ever since that day, he's continued to bless me, and he's continued to be a good God to me. And I'm sure 90% of us have that same experience in here today. We take no good, rotten people, and if you're not a no good, rotten people, you're lying. I'm no good, I'm rotten, so are you. But yet, that doesn't diminish how good our God is. He loved me. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. And if you want a true life story, you don't have to go to Acts chapter 22 and look at Paul. You can look at me. You can look at someone who doesn't know what he's doing, someone who's still learning, but someone who is a sinner, who's messed up and made mistakes. And yet if God saved me, I guarantee you God can save you. And so this morning I want to ask you, do you have a testimony? We consider our life a book, right? You graduate high school, oh, you're starting a new chapter. You graduate college, oh, you're starting a new chapter. You get married, oh, you're starting a new chapter. When is salvation in your book? If it's not, you need to start a new chapter. You need to start a new part in your book, and it needs to begin with Jesus. But if you do have a story and you do have a salvation, then why don't we share it with other people? That's what people need. They don't need self-help books. You're a self-help book. And there's someone waiting for you to tell them your story. And we think we're waiting on something. We're waiting on God to, to tell us or write it in the sky. No, he's waiting for you to take an opportunity. Even if it's with an angry, angry mob wanting to kill you. He saved you and you have a story. And there's someone out there who needs to hear it. Are you willing to tell it? This morning, if you don't have a testimony, if you never believed or trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, then your book is pointless. Your life is meaningless. Because without Jesus, you have no hope, you have no future, you have nothing. Even if you have the riches of the world, you have nothing if you have Jesus or if you don't have Jesus in your heart. And if you do, then you have a hope, you have a future, but you also have a responsibility to tell everybody your story. And so I want to close with this, and then we'll bow in prayer. Do you know Jesus? Has, has it been written on a page in your life where you say, I trusted in Jesus this day? If not, then today needs to be that day. Because Jesus is too good, God is too great, and God is too loving to leave you where you are. He wants to save you. He wants to be your Savior, but He's waiting on you to ask Him. And after this prayer, that is your time to respond. If you need Jesus to be in your life, then now is the time to respond. Would you bow in prayer with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. And Father, we look at Paul this morning and we see how horrendous of a person and how much of a murderer and how dirty he was, Lord. But Father, I can agree. I see myself in Acts 22, Lord. I see a sinner, no good, who you paid for with your blood. And so, Father, I want to thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you for saving me. But, Lord, as we enter this time of invitation, I pray for those who have never made that decision, those who have never trusted Jesus as their Savior, those who have never turned and repented of their sin. Father, I pray that they would do so before they leave here this morning. Father, allow us to use our stories and use our testimonies as weapons, as, as tools that will help us reach the world. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. 
We pray for those that need to respond. And Father, if we need to respond this morning, we pray that you'd convict us and that you would deal with us until we get it right. Forgive us where we fail you. It's in your holy son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please?